Welcome to a new installment of my talks about the fascinating Viking Iceland, a term for the first, let's say, two centuries after the colonization. This is Irina, I'm a historian and history teacher with expertise in the Viking Age and Old Norse religion, and let's look now at what made the political system in Iceland so special in comparison to the rest of Europe. So, so the settlement of Iceland did not happen overnight. It took about six decades until the country was fully populated and every plot of land had been claimed as someone's property. After the beginning of the settlement, led by the semi-legendary figures Ingolvur and Hjörleivur, two foster brothers running away from Norway after killing a Jarl, a political system starts to take shape. The settlers came from different districts of Norway, were accustomed to different legal traditions, so clashes must have been unavoidable. However, a certain type of leadership seems to have been settled early on. In the arrangement that was determined, the leader's title is Goldi, a chieftain. The office has a long tradition with roots that lie deep in the history of ancient Germanic culture. It is indeed, as suspected, related to the word God. And to begin with, these chieftains, like their predecessors, predecessors in the early Middle Ages, have presumably been religious leaders of some sort. But the office of Gordi in Iceland denotes a rather political than religious role. We know this because the office remains unchanged before and after the conversion of Iceland. In about 965, the country is divided into quarters. And as administrative entities, the division is permanent, with only minor border changes until the modern age. In each quarter, three district assemblies are established, with the exclusion of the North Quarter, which has four of them. On the whole, there are therefore 13 district assemblies in the land. According to the law code, Grogos, the Grey Goose, each district assembly was supposed to be conducted by three chieftains, and consequently the amount of chieftains would be 39. The number seems to have been somewhat unstable, however, um, and at certain points we have indication that the number reached as high as 48. This is the political system we see at work in the famous Icelandic sagas. The chieftains had legislative power and an indirect hold on judici judiciary power by nominating judges to the law courts at the assemblies. They were the most powerful officials in the country. And let's keep in mind that Iceland at this point has no sovereign, so no king. And it's not until the late 13th century that the country becomes subjected to the Norwegian crown. No executive means to prevent people from taking matters into their own hands, uh, a source of conflict in many sagas, but also a source of very intricate lawmaking. A chieftain's rule was not tied to a specific territory and every freeborn adult male could choose which godi of the district he supported. The relationship between a chieftain and a free individual is a bit like early medieval bond between a Germanic lord and his warriors, but with no militaristic aspects and much looser. The, in Iceland, the Godar, the chieftains, did not have the authority of lords, and the lord-peasant relationship, so widespread in the Middle Ages in Europe, barely existed. Although there were differences among farmers in wealth and influence, even tenant farmers retained most free men's rights. The option was available and farmers, particularly rich and important ones, could, if dissatisfied, shift their allegiance, in extreme instances even move. Public authority was maintained by personal agreements, um, usually between leaders acting as advocates for an individual or a group. Such decisions took part took place at a local thing or the general assembly, the all thing, or at a meeting between two or more important leaders. The Godar, uh, the chieftains, assume therefore the role of legal middlemen, specialists in feud, who, because of self-interest or kinship relationships, political obligations, payment, were willing to help a farmer embroiled in a dispute. The compensation to the chieftains for their services also formed a source of income. I um, uh, mentioned a lot more about taxes and income possibilities for chieftains in a video I linked above. It was therefore a system based on consensus, arbitration and intricate compromises. The 39 chieftains in medieval Iceland had great responsibility towards their followers. 
Every time a freeborn man suffered a wrong, he depended on his chieftain to set things straight. Because, I repeat, we had no executive power. Most common people were, therefore, dependent on the chieftain's protection. Arbitration took place at the district assembly closest to the scene of the crime, given that both parties involved were attending the same assembly. In those instances where each party belonged to a different quarter, the court case was appealed to the general assembly, the all thing, um, which stood for the country as a whole. We know which district assembly was established first. It was called Kjallarnesting, located a few kilometers north of what is now the capital of Iceland, Reykjavik. The Kjallarnesting was founded at the start of the 10th century, and some scholars have seen it as a direct precursor to the General Assembly, to the Althing. The other assembly we know of for sure to have been established before this uh, Althing is Thortnesting, the one described thoroughly in the first chapters of Erbigya Saga. Snorri Godi, who is the saga's protagonist, is one of the three chieftains involved in this assembly and we can assume from the account of his development that he inherits the chieftaincy. The acquisitions of chieftaincies by inheritance was customary in medieval Iceland, um, so it's no wonder that uh, we have this example in the saga. Further examples include in the south quarter Rangarthing, which would have been the local assembly of two important characters from Njol saga, Gunnar and Njol, <clears throat> even if it is nowhere mentioned as such in the sagas. Um, and speaking of this saga, it should also be mentioned that chieftains play a big role in many of the sagas, but in others not. So the two characters I mentioned before, Gunnar and Njol, are very influential in their region, but neither of them is a chieftain. We have evidence of even more assemblies than 13 that seems to have uh, existed for only short periods of time. The number 13 comes from the Grey Goose Law, the written law collection, and we must keep in mind that it wasn't until the early 12th century that the law was recorded in writing for the first time. So this means that the reality of the settlement and of the 10th century may have been a lot more complicated. All 13 assemblies relate in manifold ways to the old thing, which was positioned on a field called uh, Thingvelir, which yeah, comes from the word volur, which means field, in the southwest. The local assemblies were also called spring assemblies because they were held in May and the procedures took four to seven days. The old thing, however, started at the end of June, so unsolved cases could be re-argued here. The chieftains travelled with their followers from all parts of the country and convened for their lawmaking and arbitrating for two weeks during the summer. It was also a large social gathering, so not only lawmaking, with people exchanging stories and impressions and creating new bonds, so something like networking nowadays. The establishment of the old thing is described in the writings of the Icelandic historian Ari the Wise. His report is, however, shrouded in myth because it was put down a century after the events happened. Regardless, Thingvellir certainly has some obvious advantages as a meeting point of people from all around the island. As it was well connected with most districts in the south, west and north, it had plenty of grassland, water, a high rock uh, wall, which created a sense of community. Who was in charge of all this crowd? Well, the person responsible for the conduct of the assembly was the law speaker, Logsogumadr, or in modern Icelandic, Logsogumadr. His main role was to proclaim the laws of the free state uh, over a three-year period, which means that every year he would recite one-third of all valid law of the country. We must bear in mind that we are talking about a deeply oral society, with no effective writing system until the 12th century. So the law speaker's main requirements would have been, doubtlessly, a very good memory and a strong voice. Since Iceland had no supreme ruler, the law speaker became even more important and as elsewhere, uh, than elsewhere as a leading figure. The hilly landscape is the ideal setting for him to stand and recite the law, pronounce sentences, issue summons and make announcements. 
The exact position of the law called the log recta or log recta remains an enigma to this day. This was the center of legislation of the old thing. It consisted of the 39 chieftains, but since the North Quarter had 12 instead of 9 representatives, three supplementary seats were added for each of the other quarters. This gives us a total of 48 chieftains and each one would bring two councillors with him. So all in all, the law court included 144 men plus the law, law speaker and later on two bishops as well. The seating arrangement is told to have been circular with three benches in a row where the chieftains would sit in the mid row and their councillors in the back and front rows. These were the representatives responsible for the election of the law speaker. They enacted and accepted law proposals according to which judgments could be passed. It was thus the most powerful institution of the, let's say, Icelandic parliament, the Althing. The Althing was the venue for solving those legal disputes that could not for some reason be solved in the quarters. When a dispute could neither be settled in private nor through arbitration, the last option was to challenge your opponent to a duel. This was a legitimate procedure until the year 1005, so shortly after the conversion to Christianity, um, when the two opponents could settle their accounts by sword fight within a marked border, and if one of them set, stepped outside of these borders, he would lose. And at Thingvellir, we find an island um, used to this purpose, according to some sagas at least. The Althing was inaugurated or consecrated by the leading Godim and dissolved by the weapon taking. So basically, when you attended the assembly, you are supposed to be unarmed. Uh, confiscation courts were also appointed in order to share out the property of those found guilty. Not all of them succeeded in their task because sometimes force had to be shown, if not exerted, and some men who had been sentenced to outlawry remained on their property with a band of followers to defend it, and others made a quick getaway. Legal disputes feature prominently in the sagas of the Icelanders, and prosecution and defense of a case followed clearly defined procedures. Cases were prepared some time before the thing and could be dismissed if they were technically flawed. Preparation generally took one or two forms. You either had a panel of neighbors that could be called, comprising five to nine people who lived near the scene of the incident or the home of the accused to testify of, about what happened, or you could have a party going to the home of the accused to summon him. Penalties depended upon the seriousness of the case and took the form of, of either monetary compensation or outlawry. Lesser outlawry lasted for three years, while full outlawry meant that a man must not be fed or helped, and this was basically a death sentence. A confiscation court would seize then the belongings of a man outlawed for three years or life. What do you think about how things worked here? Write in a comment, thank you for listening to me, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Cheers!